this Wednesday. Everyone loves a good prayer meeting, one of the most important ministries of the church. And speaking of prayer, I'm going to pray for Norman. Yeah, Father, just lift Norman to you. Father, we love this man, and we love what he brings to us. And we pray, Father, you just help us to listen, and Father, to, uh, to, to be changed by your words, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. still trying to work out how to put this, th this thing on. So if it falls off again today, that would be uh, another, uh, that would be a continuation from last time. Good morning, everybody. Um, please open your Bibles. Um, I'm going to be in the book of Hebrews today. Uh, David just said, would I bring something uh, that was on my heart this morning? And uh, I've been working my way through the book of Hebrews for about the last two months, uh, just uh, studying my way through it and being absolutely thrilled with this book. So I'd love to preach the whole book to you today, but I'll restrain myself, and um, I'm going to be actually in, in Hebrews chapter 12 and 13, although I will be referring to other parts of it. So if you'd like to find that in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, and um, some verses from verse 12, the first three verses uh, from verse 12, and uh, so chapter 12, and then um, also from later on in in chapter 12, verse 26 and 28 is where I'm going to be. Okay, so I don't know why this is, it's a bit too near for me at the moment. Is that okay? Okay, so uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 to 3, it says this. Sorry, I don't know what's wrong with this, but it's, is it pointing? Is it? Okay. Um, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. An amazing bit of scripture. And then another, if you look further on uh, into, um, which is, this is the reason we need to throw everything off, uh, is uh, chapter 12, verse 26. And, says this, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate removing of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. I don't know when you last read the book of Hebrews, or uh, read through it. If you haven't ever read it, it's a great book to read, because it helps you to understand so much of the Old Testament. It's almost like a, a book that encapsulates the whole of the, the Old Testament. And uh, lots of things that perhaps you found puzzling in uh, the Old Testament are sort of brought into focus in the book of Revelation because the whole focus of the Scriptures is Jesus Christ. That is the focus. It's the, the plan that God had from the beginning of time to bring salvation to the earth. That men and women who rejected God and said, we don't want you ruling our lives, would find that there was one who was sent, prophesied in the Old Testament 700 years before in the book of Isaiah, prophesied that he would come. And it, this uh, Hebrew sort of brings together all that history. See, it, it works with the Hebrews. We don't even know who wrote it, actually. But uh, it may have been, people have said it could be Barnabas, it could be Paul, uh, there the are other suggestions of who it could be. But one thing that's sure about the book, it's a book of encouragement to help us see where our faith fits and what we calling ourselves Christians means in terms, not just of today, but what it means in terms of the whole history of the earth, of what has been and what will be. And so I'm just going to give you a very quick resume, if I may, of some of the bits of uh, uh, Hebrews 
because I want to focus on this verse that I've read, and I'm going to read it again. At the end of a great focusing on history, the writer of the Hebrews says this, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, often people read that and think, oh, is that just all the people that get mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11? Well, of course it is. It's people like Enoch and Moses and all that lot that are mentioned. If you haven't read uh, Hebrews chapter 11, you ought to read it because it's a book that will build you up and make you think, these are those people who've been before me. And I am now walking, as it were, in the good of what they have brought in their lives, demonstrating the faithfulness of God. Moses and all Joshua and all that lot, seeing amazing miracles, seeing provision of God. In fact, Elizabeth, one of the things I've been praying about when I, I read about, I've been following the news and praying a lot about Ukraine and reading about families and children, um, as it were, in Maripol, just uh, in the underground there with no food. And I was, I was walking yesterday, walking my dog, and, because I found that I, I've, I've had to uh, almost rethink the way I'm praying. Because I've been, at the beginning, I was telling God what ought to happen. I think some of you have been doing that as well. Well, this ought to happen. And then getting disappointed when it didn't happen. And I thought, that's my problem. My problem is I need to make room for the sovereignty of God. I need to be saying, God, what will you do? And I started praying over them some of the history that the scriptures tell us, as I've been reading Hebrews, about provision of I don't know how many thousand people in the wilderness who had no food. And what did God do? Miraculously, he produced quail to come and feed them. When they had no water, what did he do? They struck the rock. Now, what are you thinking? Oh, well, they're just stories from the Old Testament. No, that's why it says, since we are surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, that is all supposed to show us. Listen, even today, in 2022, whatever it is we're in, listen, this is, this is the time when, when we actually can draw on this history and say, this God who created the world is not changed in his, in his attitude. He's not changed in the way he, he conducts himself in terms of people. He expects us to look to him to do what we cannot do. My problem is, I often look to do what I can do. And, and I see myself as feeble and unable, and, 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 I, and I can think, oh, well, well, and I can get depressed. But actually, when I look at God, and what not only can he do, but he has done, and the history of people, even today, speaking of the provision of God. This book is supposed to grip us. This book should be taken three times daily. And you should read, it's a lot of, chap lots of chapters in it, but actually read it. Read the history of this God that we say we believe in. See, almost the first book of the book, I will get onto that verse, but almost the first book says this, in the past, this is chapter one, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets and many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. You see, in the past, but now, this, this Easter that we celebrated last week, let me tell you, it's bang up to date. It's not just a day, oh, in the year, oh, Easter day. No, actually, it's living and active. Why? Because we worship one who is not dead, but one who is very much alive. The, the history of, 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 of Jesus on the cross is that he was raised from the dead. Now, if he was raised from the dead, that means he's alive. And if he's alive, that means those who call themselves by his name, can trust in him and put their confidence in him and say, God, in the past you did this. You have written about it. It's been testified. It's been witnessed to. God, I am going to set my face to trust you for what you will do today. Or is it that this generation is beyond hope? Is it that that was the, that was, you know, the generation that God loved and this generation is beyond hope? I don't believe it. I pray for this generation, for these people, as people have prayed for generations that have gone before. Listen, this Jesus 
who we are trusting in, is very much on the throne. It says he ascended into heaven to seat, be seated at the right hand of the Father. And let me ask you a question. What is he doing now? What is he doing now? That is a question. It's not a rhetorical question. It's a question. What is he doing now? Somebody help me out. He's interceding for us. What does the word interceding mean? It means he's saying, Father, help them. And he is pleading our case. And if I, if I ignore that, I ignore the fact that I'm surrounded by this great amount of people who are witnessing to me today that they love God. Do you remember, have you ever read um, 2 Kings chapter 6? When Elisha found himself uh, in, uh, in a city and uh, uh, because he'd been, he'd, been, he'd been telling the king of Israel about what the king of Aram had been doing. They said to him, he said, oh, which of you is betraying us? The king of Abraham said, one of you, one of you, every time I make a plan, this guy Eli Elisha keeps telling the story of what I'm doing. Now, which one of you is it? And they said, it's not any of us, it's Elisha. In fact, he even tells them, other people, what you say in your bedroom. So he said, right, well, let's find him and let's sort him out. So they surrounded where he was. Do you know this story? It's, a new te it's an Old Testament story where they surrounded the city and when Elisha got up in the morning, he looked out, the whole city is surrounded with horsemen and armies. And um, his poor old servant got, turns to jelly and says, oh, my master, what are we going to do now? And Elisha says something that needs to be ingrained into the heart of every Christian today. Do you know what he said? Listen, do not be afraid, for those who are with us are greater than those who are against us. It's not the story of the Old Testament, isn't it? No, it's an up-to-date story where God is saying, will you trust me? Will you put your confidence in the history of what I've done in this world? And will you... Allow me to work in your world now, in your generation now, in your home, in your situation. For I want to be the same as I was yesterday. I want to be the same today. It says in the early chapter of chapter 2, it says, This salvation that was announced by the Lord and confirmed by signs and wonders and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Listen, do we now, even today, see the gifts of the Holy Spirit being manifested amongst us? Not just us, but churches that love God, do we? It's, it's almost like a link from the past. God is saying, that isn't just old history, there is a link from the past. And you still have me working by my Holy Spirit amongst you today. Will you not put your trust, says the Bible, in the same God who did things yesterday and the day before, will you not trust him for what he will do today? The answer has to be yes. Or the answer is, we don't believe in God. We don't actually believe in the God of the Bible. Now, I'm as challenged by this as you are. So as I'm praying for Maripol and all these things, and any other things, I'm, I've got to... I'm, Lord, I'm asking you, I've got to step out and pray for you to do what I cannot do. For you are God, I'm not God. Please help me to grow in my faith. Please help me to raise my game, as it were, in my understanding of who you are. That's what I pray. I pray ordinary wor words like that. I pray, God, just help me to raise the, 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 the way I live. And just exactly what Lou was saying as she was leading worship. So what want to, God, we want to be like you want us to be. And this is what this verse says that we've been reading. It says here, um, fix, therefore, since you're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. How? Fix 
fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand side of the Father. There's some things there that need to be unpacked. If we are to say the history that is in uh, the, the church all the way back through to Moses and all that lot, that, if that's going to count for anything, then the Bible is saying, now will you step up and take your place? It's interesting in that, did you notice it says, um, let us run with perseverance, not just aimlessly, it says the race marked out for us. I'm going to ask you, what race is marked out for you? What is it that God's called you to do, to be? It doesn't have to be spectacular. It doesn't have to be broadcast on YouTube. It doesn't have to be any of those things. But what it has to be is what has God put in front of you today, tomorrow, and the next day? For that is the race that God has set for you. Have a think about it just for a moment. What is the race? Maybe it's bringing up your family. Maybe it's, I don't know, teaching in a school. Maybe it is uh, working in a particular business amongst all sorts of people that uh, you work with, colleagues and so on. Maybe it, it, you, you work in a care home or a hospital. Maybe you, you, you don't work, but you, 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 you know, you're retired and, uh, and, and the world wants to put you at one side and say, oh, you're no good now. But actually... God's called you to pray. God's called you to, to be a father or mother to, to people who are only just now finding their way through life. What is the race that God has called you? This verse is saying, since you are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, throw off everything, it says, that hinders. What are the hindrances? What are the hindrances in my life that Prevent me from throwing off everything that hinders. And it says sin that so easily entangles. Now, the sin that so easily entangles in some ways seems easier to identify. Because we don't want to sin. We don't want to be tripped up by sinning. But when it says, um, it says uh, uh, um, throw off everything that hinders, that, that's a bit vague. What, what do you mean by hinders? I was reading just recently, I've been studying my way through quite a few books recently, but I was reading about um, a, a, a story that, that just gripped me, that just, uh, I don't know, it, I knew about Nelson Mandela. You know, he spent, I think it was 27 years on Robin Island in, in prison, isolated. Do you know the story of him? South Africa. Got in quite an angry man, really. When, when he was released, somebody, probably a reporter, came up to him and asked him a question. And the question they asked is, how have you changed in these last 27 years? His answer is quite surprising. His answer what to the question, how have you changed in these last 20 years? He said, I have come out mature. And actually he went on to explain that during those 27 years, he'd been so full of bitterness and anger. And then he came to realize that actually that bitterness wasn't getting him anywhere. And it wasn't going to achieve the aim that put him in prison in the first place, to see this liberation that he was after. And so he repented of it. And he turned the way he was. Actually, he described it, I became mature. Do you see how hindrances can be so that we need to identify some of these hindrances? Actually, bitterness and anger, uh, yes, but if, if this hadn't happened and that hadn't happened in my life, oh, well, then I'd really be able to serve God. Now, hold on. Nelson Mandela was saying that. He was saying, no, I've become mature. 
You see, it's interesting that the whole of Hebrews, actually, as you work your way through it, one of the things that it keeps repeating is that we have to change and become mature. And when you get to Hebrews chapter 6, if you'd like to find that just for a moment, um, he, there's an appeal, really, by the writer to the church. And he's saying, when you, it's Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. I think I might need to... Um, oh, yeah, I'll go back to Hebrews chapter 5, uh, verse 13. It says... Oh, no, I won't. I'll go back to verse 11. There we go. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. We have much to say about this, all this history, but it's hard to make you, uh, it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, by this time, you ought to be teachers. You need, for, you, you need somebody to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. Then this is the bit that's quite familiar to us. You need milk, not solid food. And then it goes on to explain, anyone who lives on milk being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. And then into chapter 6 it says this, Therefore, therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death, and faith in God, instructions about cleansing rites, and laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. See, that's a very, very telling little phrase. It says, let's move on to maturity. What is they moving on from? Well, at the beginning, spend, wasting it. they knew the gospel, and then they said, but does God really love me? Does he really care for me? And he says, well, don't, don't, let's, let's settle it once for all. Does God love you? You know, when that question comes to me, actually, there's, I realize, it's taken me time, but it's, I've realized there is a simple answer. Does God love me? I, I mean, circumstances go wrong, and, I, and I'm overlooked, and I'm, I don't know, I don't know what happened. And I'm just, oh, well, does God really know? Does God really care? I'm not despising this. I'm trying to explain something that genuinely happens in my life. Situations come. Opportunity that I thought was going to be there is suddenly taken away. Does God know? Does God care? I could fall into it easily. It's a hindrance. And I love this verse. It says, it says if we will move on from that and settle it. You see, the answer is easily settled. Does God love me? All I need to do is to look back 2,000 years. Where am I looking 2,000 years back to know that God loves me? Tell me. The cross. I'm, I'm looking at Jesus hanging on a cross, saying this, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Into your spirit, your hands, and I give my spirit. That's that's. I only need to look there. Does God love me? Yeah, my circumstances, they, they can come and go, and, but does God love me? He, he doesn't need to do anything more to demonstrate that he loves me. And I don't know what your Bible says at the end of that, but at the end of that verse 3 that I've just read from chapter 6, it says, I've just read instructions about baptisms and laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And then it has, what is it, four, five, six, seven words. I think your Bible probably says the same as my translation. It says this, verse 3, and God permitting, we will do so. And God permitting, we will do so. If we want to throw off everything in a good way, that is, as this verse is saying, everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, listen, if we will do that, God will permit us to move on. And God permits. In other words, I love that verse. It says, and God permitting, we will do so. It's almost like it says, do you want a building, pro do you want a building permit for your life, for the next stage of your life? Well, apply to God. And when you go to him, you say, now, 
had you got rid of? Have you thrown off everything that hinders and, and habitual sins that keep tripping you up and entangling your feet? Have you done that? If you have, I'll give you a building permit for the next bit. But if you're still full of bitterness and anger and still wondering whether I love you, how, how, can, I, how can I give you a building permit for the next bit? I mean, I mean you'd, you'd fall over directly, I'll build on you. See? The book of Hebrews, Hebrews is trying to say, listen, there's this cloud of witnesses. There's this history that's gone on. Now, we in this age are being handed the baton. Will we run with it in the part that God is giving us to do? Will we be those that actually say, um, I, I, I will run with perseverance the race marked out for me? You and I need a, burn, a, a building permit. Can I ask you to think about this this week? Is there any area that entangles you? Is there any habit that stops you moving ahead? Is there any way that you're being hindered by the way you think about God, or you think about your trials, or you think about difficulties? Do you know what it's doing? It's stopping you moving on. And if you truly want to move on, you need to, it says, throw off everything. Everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and start to run. I'm preaching this to you because I've preached it to myself. I've preached it to you because I've had to come to terms with it and I am still coming to terms with these things. I am not perfect, but I do have a God who's determined to keep changing me. You've heard me say this before. He, he loves me as I am, but he loves me too much to leave me as I am. And he's the same God that loves you. Run with perseverance now, once we've dealt with these things, and it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Where do you fix your gaze? Where, 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 I'm talking about daily life now. I'm talking nuts and bolts. Monday morning, it's coming tomorrow. I, I, I just ask you, where do you fix your gaze? You've heard me say this phrase before because it's one of my favorites. Do you get up saying, good Lord, it's morning? Or do you say, what is it? Good morning, Lord. It's a challenging little phrase that's stupid. But it does reflect something of our attitude. And this bit of verse in Hebrews is saying, since you're surrounded by such truth and such love, throw off everything that hinders and sin that so easily entangles, run with, the, with perseverance, the race marked out with you. Fix your eyes on Jesus, who is the pioneer and perfecter of your faith, who for joy endured the cross. You think, ah, how could he do that? Joy? It was, it was the worst form of death that the Romans could even devise. No. He could see what his sacrifice of himself would produce in thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people like you and me. And it filled him with joy. And even though in the Garden of Gethsemane, he cried out, Father, if it's possible that this cup could be taken away from me, let it be taken. But he then added that phrase that you know so well, but not, don't you know it? My will, but He submitted himself wholly to the Father's will. I find that hard. Don't you? And then it says he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Because it was finished. He declared it from the cross. It is finished. What was finished? It. Well, what's it? The sacrifice for sin had finally been given. The whole of Hebrews, you see, 
It talks about, you know, the priests who had to day by day give sacrifices. And then Jesus comes in the order of Melchizedek, one who is, hasn't got any history as a priest. He's not even from the tribe. But it has this phrase in Hebrews, which you ought to find. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You ought to find, and it says, he did this by the power of an indestructible life. That's how he overcame for us. That's why he died on the cross. It was by the power of an indestructible life. I think you'll, you'll find it the same in your translation. I'll leave you to look it up. Then you can do some bit of homework. The power of an indestructible life. And he wants you and me to have the same power at work within us. Of a life that isn't pulled here and there by the world and all the ideas that the world has. But there's an indestructibility about us because we're solidly built on the promises of God. Do you understand? Because elsewhere in the Bible, in Hebrews, which I'll leave you to find, it also says the reason we should do that, of course some of you are cheating now, because your your phones now, you can look up the little question mark and you can type in that phrase. Well, I've forgotten that you could do that. But it talks about, for we are inheriting an indestructible kingdom. Can I ask you, do you believe that? That this kingdom that we say we're part of is an indestructible kingdom. What does that mean? Surely it means that actually when all is said and done, the thing that will remain is the kingdom of God. And that's that next verse that I started reading, I read from chapter 12, which says, once more, it says in the scriptures, God's saying, not, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens. And the ones, words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And let's be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. The Bible well, you know, because I spoke about heaven over quite a few weeks. The, if, you, if you're building everything you're building based upon the world that you're in now, you're in for a big surprise. For it will be burned up. It will be rolled up like a, a garment, the Bible says. And there will be a, a day when Jesus comes and takes those who have tr- put their hope in him and they will be t- with him forever. And the Bible speaks about a new heaven and a new earth. Listen, yes, we have to have houses. We have to have uh, families and money and all that stuff. Yes, we do. I'm not, I'm not trying to pretend that I, you know, I'm some sort of monk that's going to live in a corner and expect everybody else to feed me. I, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about real life. But it's saying, don't put all your eggs in that basket. Don't have all your confidence in this world. Because there is a shaking coming. Hey, listen, this is a very relevant verse, isn't it? Don't you feel that at the moment everything is being shaken? Listen, I'm sure, you know, uh, in, in AD 70, when you know, the temple was destroyed and Jerusalem was ransacked and all that, I'm sure people then thought it was the, the end of the world. I'm sure during the Second World War, uh, you know, uh, many, many situations, people thought, this is it. Um, but actually... And for many of them, it was. And, but once again, once again, the world that we live in is being shaken. It seems to me when I look at history that there's an even greater gr- global shaking going on as we're living in our time now. It seems as though each of the shakings that have gone on um, are, are getting bigger and wider and encompassing more and more of this world. And the Bible's saying, so what sort of life should we live in that case? Listen, we need to know. Where do I belong? We need to know who I belong to. Because God says, once more, I will shake. Why is he doing the shaking? It's so that what cannot be shaken will remain. He's looking for a church that will stand in offices, stand in parliament, stand in all walks of life. And there's something about them that is unshakable. They're not saying they know it all. They're not saying, I'm cleverer than you, but there's an unshakability about 
their lives. I want that life to be mine. I want my life to be have that unshakable nature to it. Don't you? I know you do. I'm looking at Luke because she already mentioned it. I know you do. And it says, throw off everything that would trip you up. Throw off everything that uh, somehow or other would hinder that coming about. And let the word of God, let him feed on it by faith with thanksgiving. Feed on it. You say, oh, I've got to read my Bible. No, let, do it for the joy of what it produces in you. Read your Bible because of the joy it will be producing and building something in you. You can read this book and it will build your life. Not just feed your knowledge, it builds your life. Sometimes, I, when I, I, was, I was a sort of day boarder when I was a kid, and so I would come home from at half past seven or nights or something, and my mother would say, what did you have for, for lunch? And I always knew what puddings we'd have, but I could never remember what main course we'd have. It used to drive my mother to distraction. She said, I want, to, I want to give you some sort of balanced diet, and you can only remember the puddings. You know, and, but I, I couldn't remember what I had, but it mostly made me grow. <laughs> well, at least to my height that I have now. It made me grow. Listen, sometimes I read the Bible, and... And it means something to me at the moment. And then if you were asked me later on the day, what did you read? I couldn't remember. But I trust this, that as I read it and it went into my soul, it did something in me of an eternal nature that isn't still in my head. But I don't worry about that too much. I do, I do a lot of underlining in my Bible. I write all over it. And I write notes to myself because I do forget. But I do do that because I know that I'm likely to forget but I also know that on the way it's doing something in my soul and for the joy that's set before me I get up in the morning and I read my Bible because it's like it's it's to me it's almost more important than my breakfast that somehow or other I get that word into my heart do you understand see all this throwing off business you know it sounds very negative but there is a throwing off to make room for See, it says, throw off everything that hinders, right? I'll throw that off because I'm making room for something that will build me. That's why we preach in this church. That's why we have small groups in this church. It is that we might help each other grow in God and become men and women of God who are not going to change the world in terms of politics necessarily, but in our corner, in our family, in our office, in our street, amongst our neighbours, amongst those who happen across us and, and, and need our help, we can bring the, the, the indestructible nature of the kingdom of God to others. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, and the sin that so easily entangles. Let's run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I believe this is the essence of revival. I believe revival starts with us. I believe that God puts life into individuals and those individuals share that life with others just in small ways, in small words. But together the church is built and people find hope in Jesus and hope in life. And as this shaking carries on, there are going to be more and more people around us who are in desperate need. And Jesus is looking for a church where people have, have the confidence in the provision of God to share what they have with others. It's the mark of authentic church. 
that actually we don't hold to ourselves, but we give away. And we give away in the hope and the joy that the God that gave us in the first place will give us again because that's what he's done in history. He will never leave us nor forsake us and he will not fail. I've asked Lou if we could sing an old hymn this morning. You'd expect an old hymn from me. It has the words, Restore, O Lord, the honour of your name. I have been singing this in the woods as I walk my dog in the morning. It's become my prayer for this nation. Restore, O Lord, if you come up, Lou, the honour of your name in works of sovereign power. Sovereign power in me. Sovereign power in you. And can we have the words up? Come shake the earth again, that men might see and bow in reverent awe before the living God, whose kingdom shall outlast the years. Can I invite you to stand and let's just put this together uh, in the small groups. I'm going to ask you to, I will write to you about this, but look at chapter 13 in your small groups. And it's a lot of practical stuff that you can do to outwork what we've talked about this morning. Thank you, David.